Would you pray with me? God, we uh, come to you thankful, worshipers, seeing our need for you, seeing our need for the blood of God, uh, thanking you again this morning for forgiveness of sins, for new life uh, in your name, Jesus. I pray that we would, as we hear your word, we would have teachable hearts, that you would grow our love for you as we hear your word, and that you would help as we look at uh, Ephesians 5 uh, these next several weeks, you would help us to, to strengthen the, the homes by your grace, that you would strengthen the families in this room so that we would be a, a testimony, a shining light in a crooked and perverse generation that, that holds high the name of Christ. So Jesus, we pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning. As you can tell, I am not uh, Smedley. Uh, we are uh, taking a, a quick break from the book of Revelation for the next couple weeks and, uh, and doing a, a series on the, the Christian home, uh, looking at Ephesians 5 and 6 to really look at, for, for all of us together, to look at this, this really all-important topic. What does it look like to have a, a home that's submitted under Jesus Christ? For all of us to, to consider together as a church what a, a healthy home life looks like, what healthy parenting looks like, what it looks like to, for a father and a husband to shepherd in a, in a loving, sacrificial way, and for a wife to submit in a respectful, humble way. And I hope that you'll be encouraged these next several weeks as we, uh, as we look at uh, this, this passage in Ephesians 5 and 6. And I, and I have for you, uh, it's on the book table, uh, actually a resource. We just encourage, if you don't have this, to put, pick this resource up, The, the Christian Home, as I stole the, the title from Paul Shirley here. Uh, in this book, it's a, it's a short book, it's an easy read, he walks through this passage and he asks at the end of every chapter just some discussion questions. A really good opportunity to take some of the things we're going we're gonna to look at the next several weeks and apply them, you know, as spouses, to ask each other some of the questions that he, uh, he asks of you, really to help you flesh out what does it look like to, to lead, to submit, to parent in a way that pleases the Lord. So again, we're going to be at Ephesians 5. You can turn your Bible to Ephesians 5. Uh, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 22 through 24 this morning. We're going to look at the wives this morning. Uh, next week, the husbands, verses 25 through 33. And then the, the following week, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, uh, children and parents. And as you know, we've been in the, the book of Revelation. We've been in Revelation chapter 9. And as I was just sitting, listening over the last several weeks to Revelation 9 and thinking about this series upcoming I just thought about the, the nature of the satanic attack on this world. Smed's been in Revelation 9 showing us the details of this future history where uh, all of hell is unleashed on the world, and you have these demonic forces. Uh, me and my wife were having a conversation. Are these, are these locust-sized horses, or are they horses that fly like locusts? But you see the, just the demonic activity explicit in your face in the world in Revelation 9, and I was thinking, just as I was listening to that, the, the way that Satan works in the world today is obviously much more subtle. In Revelation, you're going to see it with your eyes, those who are left on the earth. But for us, just to consider this morning, what are, what are the ways that Satan works in this world? What does he go after today in a more subtle way? And I would, I would submit to you two things that Satan hates, that Satan wants to destroy. Obviously, he hates the gospel. He hates the name of Christ. But Satan hates the church. Uh, he hates what we do in here. He hates fellowship. He hates us singing praises of Christ. He hates us taking communion, looking back on the cross, looking forward to a, a returning king. Uh, Satan hates the church. He hates the, the worship that goes on here. Uh, obviously, Matthew 16, it says, the, the gates of hell, Jesus says, will not prevail against the church. But in that statement uh, is implied that the gates of hell are against the church. So Satan hates the church, but I think secondly, you could say, where does Satan direct his attacks? Uh, on the home. Uh, Satan in, in hell and his demons, they hate the home. They hate what goes on in the home, in a, in a loving home, in a home that's ordered according to God's commands. Uh, a wife submitting to her husband's leadership. A husband who sacrificially loves. Uh, they hate the, that God's created order is on display in the home. And more than that, you know that the, the home, especially marriage, 
is this unique opportunity for a, a husband and wife to put on display for the world the gospel, that we actually get to model the love of Christ, the love that he displayed on the cross, in the way that we love each other, in the way that we serve each other. And that's what we're going to look at, is we're going to look at the, the Christian home, a way to put on display the gospel in this uh, everyday battle, uh, in, in our home, as you wake up in the morning, as you go about your day, you know, the people that, that never leave you, the ones that you have to go home to every night, to, just to think about what does it look like to be faithful in, in the home. So again, we're going to be uh, Ephesians five twenty two this morning. And I was having a, a conversation recently with a, a student. We actually worked through this in our, in our student ministries, uh, this section. And it's so helpful to, just to put in front of the, the, the high school and junior high students. This is God's plan for the family. And I was talking to a student recently, and he, he just expressed that, that in that series, he realized how much of the, the world's thinking has, has even crept into his own mind. How much of the, just the influence of the world, just the subtle influence as he's hearing, this is what God says about leadership and submission. And he's saying, I didn't, I didn't realize how much of an influence the world had on me. As I felt like there was something wrong with what I was hearing, I kind of uh, was abrasive to me. I pushed against it a little bit in my heart. So, so I hope this morning, as you, as you hear this, this week and the next several weeks, that we'll actually be able to together root out some wrong thinking, some maybe some worldliness that has crept into our thinking as we think about the, the way that God has ordered the home. I think for me, I, I experienced this as I was reading, recently reading uh, in this, in preparation for this, actually a, a counseling class that I'm taking in uh, an expositor seminary uh, on, on marriage. And uh, we have to read a, a book by Martha Peace. We have to read a book for the wives, but we have to read The, the Excellent Wife. I'm sure many of you have read it. It's this classic work by Martha Peace, Excellent Wife. And what struck me is one of the first statements she makes in this book. She says, God's will for every Christian wife is that her most important ministry be to her husband. And I remember reading that and then rereading it. Is that, is that right? God's will for every Christian wife is that her most important ministry be to her husband, that her husband should be the primary benefactor of his wife's time and energy. You know, she is saying there are, there are different roles here, both, both husband and wife going after God's purposes and she coming alongside to support him, to encourage him, to strengthen him so that they can together serve the Lord. And I, and I read that and I thought, okay, that, that actually is confronting the world that we're in. Obviously, that is an, an offensive statement in the world that we're in. Uh, this confronts the, uh, the American view of marriage. Right? The American view of marriage is about self-fulfillment. What can I get for myself? How can I get the, the most satisfaction? How can I please myself? How can I make sure that my self-interest is protected? And you come to a passage like Ephesians 5.22, and you're actually left asking the question, what, what am I living for? Am I, am I aligned? Is my will and my desires, are they aligned with God's will and God's desires? Because this passage is, is clearly an affront to the world around us, the view of marriage and relationships in the world around us. So let's read this passage together. And, and as we read, just to, to ask ourselves as we read this, am I aligning my will under the lordship of Jesus Christ? That's what we're going to ask in this series. Look at Ephesians 5.22. Paul writes, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. A lot of times in the in the context of the church, someone will ask you, how are you doing spiritually? How's your spiritual life going? And there's a lot of different ways you could answer that. You know, a lot of times you think about, how's my prayer life? How am I doing at time in the word? How am I doing enduring trials? But here in Ephesians 5, you back up to verse 21, the, the section that, that this sits in, you could actually uh, equate how you're doing spiritually with how you're doing and having a submissive heart. Here, to be, to be led by the Spirit, to have a, a vibrant spiritual life in this section, is to have a, a life of submission, a submissive heart. So you could ask, how am I doing spiritual? How am I doing at submitting to authority? Whatever authority God has in my life. Look at verse 21. 
uh, right before this section, really introduces this section. Paul says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And you go back, and this is all in the, in the context, verse 18 and 19, of, of Paul saying to, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So you have the fleshly mentality being driven by, he says, drunkenness, but you could just say self-indulgence. Whatever feels good, whatever I crave, I go after. And in contrast, he says, no, be filled with the Spirit. Let the ruling disposition of your life, let what controls you be the Spirit. And we know how the Spirit works. The Spirit is a person. He works through the Word of God. So to be filled with the Spirit is to have a life in submission to the Spirit. Really to have a life in submission to truth. To say, I want to be filled with the Spirit means I want the constraining, uh, constraining reality in my life, the constraining influence in my life to be the Spirit the impulse of my life to be God's word, to walk in obedience. And then he's going to spell out for us, what does it look like to have this spiritual life, to be led by the Spirit? How would I know if, I, if I'm living spiritually? Well, verse 19, he's going to talk about speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart. So you have a, a singing to one another. You have a gratefulness in your own heart. Verse 20, always giving thanks. So you have this, this singing, thankful, grateful people, and, verse 21, those who are subject to one another. Uh, submissive people. They are a grateful, thankful, singing, and submissive people. That's what it means. That's what it looks like to be, to be led by the Spirit, to have a vibrant spiritual life. And that really crushes the idea of uh, American individualism. You know, in our country, to say, no one can tell me what to do. I heard in my house from a, a five-year-old uh, the other day to one of her siblings, you can't tell me what to do. You're not in charge of me. Right? And that is the, the cry of our heart. You can't tell me what to do. You're not in charge. And here we see that the, the Christian, verse 21, the disposition of a follower of Christ is to say, I am not in charge. I am submissive to whatever authority the Lord has put in my life. In, in the New Testament, you see different spheres of authority. You see government authorities. First Peter looks at governing authorities, church leaders as authorities, husbands as authorities. Here in Ephesians, he's going to work through these, these spheres of authority in the home, the, the husband and wife, parents and children. He goes into the, the slaves, indentured servants, and their masters. These are the, the home life, the spheres of authority that you face in daily life in the home. And if I was going to start this series, I thought about this series, and in my mind, I'd, I would start with the men. All right, we got to start with the men. We got to encourage the men to lead. Men, you have to step up. That's where I'd want to start. But then you see where Paul starts. He starts with the wives and their submission. And I think that's really helpful for us. It's instructive because it's actually going to up the ante on what it looks like to lead. To ask a wife to submit, you have to ask to submit to what? What is she submitting to? What kind of leadership is she following? So as we look at the, the wives here, we're going we're gonna to actually look really hard at the husbands. As we're looking at her submission, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually raise the stakes for a husband. So husbands, next week we're going to look specifically at the instruction to husbands. But, but this week, you are not off the hook. You're going to see the, the high cost, the, the high responsibility of being a leader in the home. So we're going to look at this morning in this passage three characteristics of a wife's humble submission. Three characteristics. Again, under this banner of the, the Christian home. What does it look like to, to live a, a spirit-filled, a home that is conformed to truth, that is operating under, operating under the lordship of Christ? And this is a humble submission. Uh, she is submitting under, under the Lord, a humble heart that sees Christ as king and her as his subject, as his slave, as, his, as one who has been blood-bought by Christ. Uh, Paul Shirley, in that book, he, he writes, Wives cannot live in submission to the Lord if they are not living in submission to their husbands. You could go through all the external motions of church life, all the activities and Bible studies and show up on Sunday. 
But if your, your heart disposition in your home is not one of submission, you are not following after the Lord's purposes for your life. You are not uh, aligned with his will. And if you're not married in here, I, I know there's going to be a temptation to check out. Say, okay, good. I can wait for three weeks and then start listening. Maybe I'll read Revelation 10 and see what's next. But, but actually, there is, there is something for all of us in here. There's a couple ways you can listen to this. As the church, for all of us as the church, to recognize this is what God requires of families. This is what we're all trying to encourage each other toward. This is what you can pray for the families to go after. This is how you can encourage young women and young men in this church. This is how you can encourage the moms and dads in this church. This is how you can pray for them. So listen as a, as a member of, of God's family to encourage others, but also listen from the perspective of what does it look like to submit. All of us have authority in our lives. All of us have different spheres of authority. None of us is without authority. All of us have a governing authority. In the church, there is authority. All of us are, are confronted with authority on a daily basis. So these principles of submission for a wife, uh, as you zoom out, can apply to all of us. The same heart disposition that a wife brings to her submission is the heart disposition we all must bring to submission to whatever authority. As he says in verse 21, that, that all of us to be subject, all of us be submissive. This is a, a Christian disposition, an attitude of submission. And as we define submission, obviously the question comes to your mind, what, what is submission? What do you mean by submission? What do you not mean by submission? Uh, maybe your Bible, verse 21, 22, uses the word subject, be subject to one another, verse 21, and then carried forward in verse 22, wives, be subject. This is the word for submission, uh, to be subject, to, to submit your will under the will of another. There's certain words in our family that at the dinner table, we say, you can't, you can't say these words at the dinner table. And I think uh, they're not, not appropriate, right, in polite conversation. And submission is one of these words. In our society, hey, you can't, you can't say that word out loud. You can't say that word in polite society. Uh, such a misunderstood reality. And a raw definition here of this word is to order oneself under a leader. Order oneself under a person worthy of respect because of their office. So as we think about a marriage, you have different roles. A husband who is the leader, who bears the responsibility, and a wife who supports that responsibility. One commentator says that submission is a disposition to yield to the husband's authority and an inclination to follow his leadership. A disposition and inclination. And I love this because it captures the, the heart attitude. Not just external conformity, not just the smiling and nodding, but a, a disposition of the heart to support his leadership. It's a, an active support for the wife to say, I want my husband to lead, and I'm going to do everything in my power to strengthen him, because this is going to be what's best for our family. I'm going to pray for and encourage and respect and reinforce and as we talk about submission, we do, we do need to say what it's not. I know that comes to, to mind pretty quick, quick. You start asking questions. Well, it's not, it's not something like servitude. It's not that somehow the, the husband just gets to, to, to bark orders in the home. Everyone has to do what he wants. And serve his every need. That's, that's not what submission is about. And it's also not a silence. It's not quietness. It's not that, okay, the, the wife is not allowed to have an opinion. She's not allowed to, to speak her opinion. She just must be uh, on the sidelines. Now again, this is a, an attitude. It said an attitude of respect, an attitude of support. And at the same time, to support a man's leadership is to actually help him to speak into decisions. You know, to tell him areas he may not have thought through well. Even just the one another commands in the New Testament still apply to husbands and wives. You still have the, the command to, to address sin in one another. The wives and husbands do this together. So this is not some kind of a, a silence. But it also doesn't mean she's going to agree with every decision. But she's not, she's not on the sidelines silent. And this doesn't have anything to do with uh, value. Both husband and wife created in God's image. Both value in the sight of God because they were created in the likeness of their creator. And it's not even a matter of ability. I mean, so many wives in this room are more capable in so many ways than their husbands. 
so much more able in so many areas. It's not a matter of ability. This is about God's created order, how God has designed the family and the home. And lastly, it's not, like I said earlier, a matter of external conformity. It's not just a, a smiling and nodding and saying, okay, I'll go along with that. It is a disposition of the heart, a yielded will, a respect from the heart to, to honor a husband because of his position. Alexander Strzok defines this way. He says, a husband takes the lead and a wife willingly and actively supports that lead. I mean, pretty, pretty simple definition. He takes the lead, she supports the lead. Uh, John Piper and, and Wayne Grudem have a, a book, Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Really, really great resource, written probably 30 years ago. And they, de- they define submission as the divine calling to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. So you have here the idea of honoring, affirming, supporting, using all of her abilities to help. And I think there's so many misconceptions about this idea of submission The reason, I think the primary reason, is because we live in a culture where there are no male leaders. There are so few leaders. Men are hard to follow because you look around and say, where are the godly men? Where are the men of conviction? Where are the men who are actually leading their homes with conviction? Uh, You look out in the world and and you cannot find men who are willing to, to sacrifice and serve and die to themselves. So we talk about submission, it's, it's such a hard concept to wrap our minds around because we don't see it modeled very often. Out in the world, we don't see it modeled. We don't see uh, male leadership modeled. You have really uh, two different, uh, you could call them ditches, that I think men fall into. On the one side, you have passivity, uh, the passive leader, the one who just doesn't want to make decisions, who wants to enjoy comfort, wants to just enjoy life. His wife is prodding him and pushing him to make a decision to lead. Or you have on the other side, the authoritarian husband, the one who just makes decisions based on his own preferences and his own desires, not taking into consideration his wife or his kids. But we find out here that the the measure of submission, as we look at verse 22, is not ultimately the the quality of the leader. It's not ultimately in the, the quality of husband, It's not ultimately in in how he leads. Submission is ultimately focused on Jesus Christ. Not because the the husband is inherently worthy, but because Christ is worthy. So here, the the first characteristic here of a wife's humble submission, number one, she focuses on the worthiness of Christ. To say Christ is worthy of praise. Christ is worthy of honor. He, He is worthy of my obedience. Look what it says in verse 22. Wives, be subject, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So here is the the focus of submission. Looking to the husband and really past the husband. Looking to the Lord. Looking to the authority over the husband. So she's submitting to the husband as she submits to the Lord. The, The Lord here, Jesus Christ, who has established authority structures, governors, leaders, rulers in the church, parents and children, and then here, husbands and wives. The authority structures in the way that his kingdom economy works. This is how he has actually delegated his authority in the world. And this is exactly what uh, Ephesians 6.1 is going to tell children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So as you obey your parents, who are you looking to? You're looking to, to the Lord who has placed them over you. I mean, this is what we tell our kids. There is a, an authority that Jesus has. There is an authority over the whole world, over all the earth, and he has delegated this authority to mom and dad in this sphere. So you are under submission to mom and dad, not because there's something special about us, not because we have some inherent authority, but because Jesus has authority and he has placed you in this home. Uh, Same for a marriage, because Jesus has authority. And this is how he has designed his universe. And this is how he has designed the, the home to go well in a way that operates under that authority. Uh, Turn back to Ephesians 1 just to see this, really the same word used and the same idea at the end of Ephesians 1, talking about the authority of Jesus. It says uh, in verse 20, the the Father 
brought about this great strength as he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. This word subjection, that is the word, uh, the same word, to put in submission. He has submitted all things under the authority of Christ, the Father, giving authority to the Son, who has all rule and authority, who is seated at God's right hand. So Jesus, who is currently reigning in heaven, resurrected, has given authority, delegated authority here to, to a husband. And the wife is submitting to that authority because she submits to the lordship of Jesus Christ. And what's so great about this passage is it says to submit to the husband as to the Lord. Is it, it is really a, an affront to the, the easy believism that is so prevalent in, uh, in our culture, in American Christianity. Easy believism that says that I want Jesus to be my savior. I want forgiveness of sins. I want eternal life. I want all the benefits of heaven. But I, but I don't want my life to change. I don't want him to be my Lord. And you know that a, a follower of Christ is one who has followed Jesus as Lord. They see him as savior of their sins, the one who has forgiven them, who has died for them, and now is the Lord of their life. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So here she is one who is submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ. In her heart, she says, you are worthy because you are my king. I am your follower. You have died for me, and now I want to live for you. So this is not a, a yoke that is put on a woman. But this is, uh, this is God's path to pleasing him. This is, the, this is actually God's grace in the life of a woman who is able to go after this command. This is how God has designed the family. And I think this principle is helpful too because you you have the question of when is it okay not to submit? There has to be an exception, right? What about if the the wife, what about if the husband sins? What about in in a hard home life, the abusive home? A husband who has just neglected his duty, who is unsafe for the, the family, for the kids, for the wife or is asking his wife to sin in some way. Well, at that point, he has stepped outside of his authority. If she is submitting under the authority of Jesus Christ, and the husband is, is calling her to sin, well, he is no longer under that authority. He has stepped, stepped outside of the realm of the authority. So she still says, I submit to Christ first. I will not follow you into sin. I will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will submit to you in as much as you're, you're not leading me into sin. And it's hard. It's hard to discern sometimes in these in decisions. Is this just unwise? What do, what do I do if I disagree? What if I do if I think he's making a mistake? You know, to wrestle with. Am I still willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, even in a even in a mistake, as long as it's not sin? And it's hard because you could horizontally, if you're if you're looking only horizontally, you could look across the room. And you look at this man and you, and you see only weaknesses and sin and frailty and all of the past decisions that he has, he has done poorly and all the mistakes that he's made. And you could only see those things. And some people are in, in really hard marriages where that's, that's all they've experienced is poor decisions. And here, the, the solution, what, what Christ commands us commands the women is, is not to ultimately look horizontally, is not to entrust yourself to him. Ultimately, you are entrusting yourself to the sovereign hand of the Lord. You're saying, I submit to my husband because I submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is not a, not a guarantee of a happy marriage, but, but a guarantee of a, a life of joy in the service of the Lord a life of fulfillment because you are going after the Lord's purposes, because you are aligned with what pleases Him. So this passage is asking you to to say in your heart, God, you are sovereign and you are good and you have placed me in whatever situation you have placed me in because you love me, because you are for me, because you have only ever done good for me. So that's the the focus here of the wife's submission on the the worthiness of Christ. And these are not just just words on a page. 
And this is a, a daily battle in our hearts, a daily battle to say, do I believe that Jesus is on his throne? Do I believe that this word is true, is from the living God? And do I believe that he gives strength, he gives his grace to those that, that follow after him, that submit themselves to this book? This is the, the battle in our own hearts to say, Jesus, you are worthy of my obedience. And this is Jesus' design, the one who has all authority. This is how he has designed the universe. And there's protection here, safety here. And that's going to bring us to the, the second point here in your outline as we work through this passage. Looking next at verse 23, the second characteristic of a humble submission. As she rejoices in the design of God. Rejoices. Says, God, your design for the universe is good. She agrees that it's good. She, she accepts this is how God has designed the universe. Look at verse 23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. You have this word head here used of, of the husband and of Christ to say here's the one who has the, the authority, God-given authority, the, the right to lead, the responsibility to lead. Uh, if you look back again, Ephesians 1, this word, we didn't get there yet, but Ephesians 1, I, I stopped right before we got to the word head in, in verse 22. When it says that, that the Father put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him, that is Jesus, the one who is head over all things, to the church. So this one, Jesus, who is head, that is to say he has authority over all things. What, he is, what God has just said, he has authority over all things. This one who is the head, who has the authority, has been given now to the church. Uh, this word head uh, it signifies a position of leadership. The word uh, literally meant, uh, was used for a, a leader in a government, in the military, when who had a, a position of leadership, that everyone recognized their leadership. And this principle goes all the way back to the, the created order. As we look at Ephesians 5 here, I think we need to ground ourselves in creation. This is God's design. Uh, man as the, the head, as the leader. This is what Paul does in Ephesians 5.31. He's going to go back to Genesis, root us in, in creation. This is how God designed it. So I want you to, to turn back, if you would, turn back to, to Genesis. Look at chapter 1 and 2, just to, just to remind ourselves, this is what God designed men and women to be. Before the curse, before there was sin in the world, before sin distorted it. This was God's good design. So look at Genesis 1, starting in verse 27 and 28. It says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So you have here in verse uh, 27 and 28 two realities, that the man and woman are both made in the image of God and that God gave them work to do. Here is the work that I have for you. And we get to Genesis chapter 2. You, you see the, really Genesis 2, starting in verse 4, is a, really a picture of the sixth day of creation. Let me give you a really a microscopic view. Here's what went on on the sixth day, is what Genesis 2 is. When God created the man and woman. So you have first the creation of the man. Look at Genesis uh, 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man, that is Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. So here is Adam in the garden with work to do, to cultivate and keep. And in verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever, whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So here in, in verse 18 and 20, repeated twice, that Adam did not have a, a suitable helper. He is going after the work that God has, has created for him. 
and he needs a, a suitable helper, one to, to support him in this work, one to come alongside of him, that is actually not good for him to be alone, that there are deficiencies in Adam that, that Eve will actually complement and come alongside to strengthen him for this task. Yeah, this word helper is used in the Old Testament to, to talk about God strengthening his armies, supporting his armies for battle, to give them support, give them more troops so they can fight. This is the, the idea here, is that the, the woman is a helper, is a strengthener to the man, to help support him in the work. A suitable helper. God made specifically for the man. You know, a husband who has weaknesses and deficiencies, uh, shortcomings, all of these blind spots. And all the women are saying amen and amen. But all of these de deficiencies, and God creates a, a helper for him, a, a helper for him in this work so they can together go after the Lord's purposes. And here you see that the, the man, right off the bat, as you read Genesis 2, is the one who is leading, is the one who has authority, is the one who has been given this charge to cultivate and keep. He is the one who starts to name the animals. He is the one who even names Eve as, as you go on in the story. He has the, the authority. It starts with him, the wife, coming alongside of this authority to support him. I was talking to a friend recently who was talking about his, his son as he was interacting about about work, a 10-year-old son saying to his dad, man, dad, I can't wait until I'm the boss so then I can fire people. I can't <laughs> wait until I can fire people. Because he's saying, I just want to be able to tell someone what to do. All right? This is, uh, this is how we think about authority, a wrong thinking of authority. I want to tell someone what to do. I want to be the boss so I can flex on them and I can, I can show them. But as we move forward in this chapter, we actually find out what does it mean that Adam has the authority, that Adam gets to make the decisions. Well, here's what it, what it looks like after they have sinned, after Eve has eaten, given to Adam and he eats. Look at verse, uh, verse 8 and then 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. This is chapter 3. In the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid himself, themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And here is uh, Adam's authority. This is what it looks like, verse 9, for Adam to have the authority. Verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? This is what it looks like. For Adam to have authority means that he bears the responsibility. You know, when they have sinned and God comes to the garden, he says, where are you, Adam? He doesn't start with Eve. She ate first. He's saying, Adam, you are culpable. You are the leader. Where were you when she was eating the fruit? Where were you when the, the snake tempted your wife? Why weren't you leading? So this is what it looks like for a, for a man to have authority, to be head over a wife. It means he bears the responsibility. Before the Lord, he is accountable. The, the buck stops with him, ultimately. So when you see a, a home in disarray, things out of sorts, chaos, all of these things that are they're not going according to, to God's instruction. Where should you look first? Where does Jesus Christ look first? He looks at the husband. He says, this is your responsibility. You are the leader. You are accountable. Whether you recognize it or not, whether you've owned up to this or not, in the Lord's eyes, the man is accountable. He is responsible. So this right he has of authority we find out it's not so much a right as a, a responsibility. And you can turn back to Ephesians 5. To, to be the head means he is responsible. The weight, the burden of leadership rests with him. And we must be convinced of this truth. Husband and wife, both convinced of this truth. A husband, to say, God has given me the authority and that means I am responsible before him for the decisions of this family, for the priorities of this family, for the, the trajectory of this family. So the man is accountable for how he leads. And then the wife, accountable for the Lord, 
for how she follows that leadership? How does she joyfully submit under that leadership? For the Lord to ask, how did you faithfully, faithfully come under the leadership of your husband and support and strengthen and help him? The husband is responsible for the the decisions, bad decisions and good decisions. And she is responsible for her submissive heart, her support in those decisions. And someone might ask, well, doesn't this just serve the husband? This is just about, so the husband gets to make the decisions and she just has to to follow him. He gets to do whatever he wants. Well, we're going to look at next week, obviously, the the one who leads, Ephesians 5.25. This is how you lead. You lead in love, sacrificial love. So yes, a a selfish leader will make decisions based on my, my own needs and my own wants and what's going to make my life easier. But the the husband who has aligned himself under the lordship of Christ leads in such a way that he is asking the question, how how can our family honor Christ? What is the the most effective way we can as a family serve the Lord Jesus Christ and obey the Lord Jesus Christ? How can I lead my wife in that? How can I lead my children in that? Together, a husband and wife, locked arms, serving the Lord, going after his purposes. So you see this passage, it raises the bar for husbands. This is what it looks like to be head of a household. This is what it looks like for a wife to submit. Uh, I've heard it said that in the military that there are those that have hard, hard leaders, and they would say, you, you salute the uniform and not the man. Salute the uniform, not the man. If he's not worthy of respect, at least the uniform is. And how sad that in so many Christian homes that that is the case, that that wives submit based purely on duty. This is what God requires, so I must do it. And for a husband to desire for your wife that she would submit out of respect because she has seen you work hard, she has seen you labor, she has seen you bear the burdens, she has seen you be the, the hardest worker, the hardest prayer, the most concerned about about your kids and their future so that she would respect and she would submit because she she says, yes, that is a leader. I want to follow him. Uh, Leadership is is defined often as influence. Just a basic definition of leadership is influence. The ability of one person to influence another. We talk about someone having a natural leadership ability. I mean, that's what we mean. You think about just a group of of peers, and someone rises above. Someone influences the others in a direction. They say, okay, that guy's a natural leader. Well, here the the husband has the authority to lead. So the question to ask yourself, men, is how am I using my authority? Am I influencing my home? You know, the husband must be the primary influence in his home. That's what it looks like to lead in the home, to be the primary influence. So, So to ask ourselves the hard question, You know, the wife who might be home the most, but is the husband the the primary influence? Does he set the trajectory? Does he set the priorities of the home? Does he set the direction? Is he the one who feels the the burdens? Even to ask uh, who leads in in parenting? Who leads in decision-making? Who leads in, in finances and how we spend our time and our resources? And I'm not asking who, you know, balances the checkbook. But who is the one who who leads the direction of the home and all of those things, in time, in resources, in in parenting, in in life, in the church? And just to to think through a a practical example, I was just thinking about just decision-making. What does it look like to be just a a faithful husband, a leader, as you're making a a family decision? So many different decisions we're faced with, small decisions and large ones. It could be something like, what, what school do we send our kids to? Or we need to take our kids out of this school and send them to another school. Or a, a new job, a new house. But any decision, you know, so often you see, like I talked about, the authoritarian or passive husband. You know, the passive one that's just being pushed and prodded by his wife. Will you please make a decision? Will you please lead in this? Or the authoritarian husband who just makes decisions, doesn't think about consequences in his home. His wife's just along for the roller coaster. But to think about decision making and saying, okay, if God has given me a helper... He has given me a suitable helper that, that I'm to, to lead 
And this is God's plan for me, is to actually have this wife that God has given to to strengthen me in this decision. What would it look like for a husband to to ask, you know, just ask himself first, you know, what are the, the weaknesses in my leadership? What are the things I haven't thought through in this? What are the, the past decisions I've made that have been hard? And then to ask his wife those questions, you know, considering that she knows all of your weaknesses, all of your faults. She knows better than anybody else your sin tendencies. She knows all the, the past decisions you've made, the good ones and the bad ones. So she knows you better than anybody else. And God has given her to you to help. Now imagine if, if you're making decisions that way, saying, I want all the help I can get from this gift that God has given as I make decisions. God has given me a gift in this. I want to I own the leadership that I have. So I want all the wisdom that I can get from my wife in this decision. I mean, that is a different perspective to say, would you help me in this? What are things I haven't thought through? What are ramifications for the, the kids and for you that might be hard? You know, to, just to say, I, I own this decision and I want your help. I want to do it well. I know you can help me in this. And for a wife to believe verse 23, to say, yes, the man is, is the head, he's accountable. Well, then her disposition changes because she is not accountable for the decision, ultimately. She is accountable for how she supported in the decision. She is accountable for her disposition. Did she bring wisdom? Did she pray? Did she encourage? You know, not just, uh, I'm going to be silent and wait for him to make a mistake. But hey, he seems to be making a mistake. I want to speak into that. I want to help him think through this. So he is accountable for the decision and she is accountable for how she supported in this decision. So we have to, to again, just press in our own minds, in our own consciences. This is God's design for a marriage. This is marriage as God intended. We need to teach this to the, the next generation, those who are growing up in this church so that they would get this biblical picture, so that young women would say, yes, I want to submit under godly leadership because I want to serve the Lord. Young men would say, I want to, I want to find those kind of women. I think so, so often you, you talk to young men and they're, maybe they're, they start dating someone and, and the conversation goes something like this. You know, I found this, this girl and she really likes me and we have a lot of fun together, personalities mesh, mesh and yeah, yeah, and she, she loves the Lord and she's godly. And, and, you know, you want the conversation to go something like this. I found this girl, and she loves the Lord, and she loves the church, and she serves, and she is eager to submit under authority because she loves Christ, and she wants to be led by godly authority because she wants to be godly. And so then you can ask the question, and this girl actually likes you. Are you sure? <laughs> that's, where you, that's where you want the conversation to go. You're thinking rightly. You know, set your standards high. For, for the women to say, I want to have a submissive heart under the, the Lord. I want to model what's in here as a, as a single woman. Whatever situation in life, just a, a disposition of submission to embrace God's design. This is the, the path to a, a blessed life, a fulfilled life. Because this is a life going after the, the purposes of the Lord. And for the, the church... The church, this is an opportunity for us as the church to encourage one another in these things. You know, there are older women who have walked this path. Uh, Titus 2, the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands and children. This is what the the church does. We we teach each other. Here's how you apply these truths. So I would just encourage you, if you're a a young couple trying to figure this out, to find an older couple who has walked this path. There are uh, elders in this church. Scott talked about just the elders and their care for the church. And part of their role is to help you apply truth like this in your own life. So I would encourage you, if you need help, this is what the church does. The church, we encourage each other in the truth. We help each other apply the truth. We speak truth to one another. And in verse 23, the, the shift here from the, the husband as head to now Christ as head. The husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. So here you have the, uh, the leadership of Christ, the authority of Christ, the one who has all authority, all rule and all authority. 
He, he has the right to be king. He came to this earth as the, the king in the line of David, the one who had the right to sit on the throne. He came to the earth as the, the firstborn son of creation, the preeminent one, the one who spoke, the agent of creation. He had the right to be king. He had authority. Inherent in himself, he had all authority. He had authority over the, the wind and the waves. He had authority over all creation. He had authority over demons. And he had authority over the grave. You remember, he says to Lazarus, come out of the grave. Jesus himself, the only, the only man who's ever walked out of his own tomb. And Jesus, who has all of this authority, what does he do? What does it look like for him to wield this authority? Well, he is the, verse 23, the, the Savior, the Savior of the body, the Savior of the church. The one who is the leader of the church is the one who died for the church. Sacrificial death for his people. And the song we sang, uh, I love the, the words there. It talked about the, the king who, who made the sun and the moon and the stars, letting the, the soldiers hold him on a cross. This is what Jesus does with his authority, is he sacrifices. This is the, the model here. And I love in this passage, all of the rest of Ephesians 5 here, you have Jesus as the model for both the, the wife and the husband. This is what it looks like to, to, to lead to sacrificially lead. And this is what it looks like to submit. A perfect picture on both sides. Jesus who submits to the will of his Father. As Ashley Anderson read in communion, that he says, not my will, but your will be done. A submissive heart of Jesus, equal with his Father. Equal with his Father in every way. Fully God. And yet he humbles himself and becomes obedient to the point of death. This is the, the model of submission. Jesus, who humbles himself under the, the purposes of God, for the joy set before him endures the cross. And this is only possible for the Christian in the gospel. If you have believed in Christ, you have now divine ability to obey, divine empowerment. I love in 1 Peter, it says the, the one who humbles himself will be exalted. God is opposed to the proud it says, but he, he gives grace to the humble. You know, the, the proud one who does not want to, to submit to their role, the husband who doesn't want to lead, the wife who doesn't want to submit, they are, they are setting themselves at odds with God and his grace. But the one who is humble, humbles themselves under God's instruction, embraces God's commands for them. The humble one, it says, God will give grace to. He will give strength. He will give a divine enablement to obey if you know Christ, you have his spirit. You have ability to obey. You can actually live out these truths in your life. I love this, uh, this analogy I, I read this week. It was from, uh, from John Piper, but it was, just, it was so good, I just want to steal it here. He, he gives the, the analogy of, of two women who are jumping out of a plane. This is the picture. Two women jumping out of a plane. And he says, one of them has a parachute, and one of them does not. And he asked the question, who is more free? Who is more free, the one who has the parachute or the one who does not? Because the world we live in would say that the one who does not have a parachute, she is unrestrained. She is totally free. No one to tell her what to do. No constraint on her life as she plunges. Rather than the one who has the parachute, this, this safety, that, that one is more free. They are, they are safe. Protection. This is what's in view here. This is uh, God's way of protecting women, encouraging them in the, the marriage relationship. Access to his grace as they submit. And that's going to bring us to the, the third point here in your outline. The last, last characteristic of a wife's humble submission is she surrenders all of her life. She surrenders all of her life. She gives up control. Gives up control of saying, I, I'm in charge. And I get to, to set the rules. And she finds freedom in Christ, surrendering under the authority of Christ. Look at verse 24. As the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Highlighting the, the in everything there. He's, he's taking the argument, the Verse 23, the husband is head, Christ is head. 
So the Christ, the church submits to Christ, so the wife submits to the husband. But here is how she does it. She does it in everything, comprehensive in scope. The same way the church, all authority is Christ. He is head over the church. You know, his word is the guide to all of our life. Every decision. You know, we don't come here on a Sunday morning and just say, hey, what do I want to do today? We say, what, is, what has Christ instructed us on how we worship? You wake up in the morning. As you wake up in the morning with Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, not just saying, I'm going to I want to give you 15 minutes today of my time. I'll do a little Bible reading. I'm going to pray a little bit. Here's 15 minutes of my time. And you say, no, this day belongs to you. Jesus, you are king. This whole day belongs to you. I'm in your service. Every decision, every day. So as the church submits to Christ, so the wife submits in all things, surrenders all of her life. No, nothing off limits. No, no secret. No hidden agendas. You know, she's transparent. She's vulnerable. You know, the, the ugly stuff and the good stuff. All of her life. So you can, you can agree with what Martha P. says as you read this. This is what she's after when she says God's will for every Christian wife is their most important ministry be to her husband. You know, picking up this idea that she is submissive in all things. She supports him in all things. Uh, Proverbs 31.12, it says that the, the excellent wife does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She does him good. She is always only ever for him. She is always for him. She only does him good. And there is a, a protection here. And I, I heard a pastor say recently, and I thought it was really insightful, that the, the reason it is so hard for women to submit outside of the, the lack of leadership. The reason it's so hard is because of fear. Because of fear. Because in any human institution, whether it's government, whether it's church leaders, whether it's parents, whether it's a husband, any submission to a, a human requires us to submit to somebody who is sinful and weak and who's going to make mistakes and the temptation is to be fearful, to fret, to try to control the circumstances. To say, no, no, I want to be in control of the situation. I want to make these decisions because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the consequences. I'm afraid of the, the circumstance that God has put me in. An unsubmissive heart is a fearful heart, a fretful heart. But here, the one who, who submits to her husband in everything, you know, is again, back to where we started, submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. She is saying, I, I submit to my husband because I submit to him. I'm not afraid because this is God's good providence for my life. You know, if you find yourself constantly railing against authority, constantly just a, a complaining heart to every leader in your life, you might have to ask your, yourself the question, you know, am I trusting in the, the sovereignty and goodness of God? Any complaint against authority, a, a real complaint, is a complaint against the Lord. It is to say, God, you are not good and you don't always do good. Rather than saying the, the sovereign hand of God has put me in this situation that I'm in, with this family that I'm in, this circumstance that I'm in, and he is good and he does good. He is for me. This is the, the humble submission, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, to recognize his care for you, to recognize that, that whatever circumstance you're in is in the Lord's timing. He's never late. He's never early. You are, you are under the providence of God. In a world that we live in that wants autonomy and independence, that wants to be free from any kind of structure that would tell me what to do, here in the church, we have a, a loving Father who graciously gives us instruction, who graciously tells us how to live, who says, I will empower you as you submit under this instruction. I will give you grace. And we get to just zoom out and think about as the church then, you step into this building, to this people, you know, from a world that hates authority, wants autonomy, 
wants to be fulfilled on their own terms. You step into the church, and what do you see is you see joyful women who, who love to submit to their husbands because they love Jesus Christ. And they say, I want to put Jesus Christ on display this week in the way that I submit to my husband, in the way that I submit to authority, because I have been transformed by the gospel. And that's what you see in the church. The world can say what it wants about how oppressive this might sound, rather than the the beauty of God's design. He's designed a a loving leadership and and a wife's humble response to that leadership to exalt the name of Jesus to say, Jesus, you are good. You do good. You are my Savior. You are my King. And that's what we get to as the church, encourage each other towards. This is uh, God's plan for your life, wives, this week, to submit under this. I want to please the Lord this week. You get to to walk in obedience to this command. Let Let me pray that we would be a church marked by this kind of submission. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your clear word. And I just pray this morning, if there are hearts that are resistant to your word, that you would soften them, Lord, that you would give eyes of faith, that you would give us fortitude, you would give us strength, divine enablement to believe, Lord, and that this week we would walk in obedience, that this week the women in this room, married and unmarried, would be your humble servants, would just love to, to put your gospel on display in the way that they submit to others, in the way that they love others, in the way that they just express gratefulness. And I pray that you would make the men in this room leaders, sacrificial servant leaders, because they love you, Jesus Christ. We pray all this in your name. Amen.